Brewing Up a Business is a 2011 book written by Sam Calagione. This book is essentially a collection of stories and anecdotes surrounding the Dogfish Head Brewing Company and the life of its key founder, Sam Calagione. While it provides tips for small business owners and startups, these tips are scattered throughout the book. Many ideas are repeated across chapters, which can be useful for someone who is not reading the book in one go, but can be frustrating if you are trying to extract information from it. The book is well written and stands as a good book to read if you want to learn more about the Dogfish Head Brewing Company, more than a book about running a successful small business. Introduction Dogfish Head is a beer company which prides itself in making types of beer that are not in the mainstream, while also using unconventional recipes. This chapter highlights the author's adventures in discovering various types of brewing techniques and materials across the globe. The author claims that many large brewing companies elect to brew beers that are common and have well-known methods. He encourages small brewing businesses to step out into the world and find various niche markets for beer. The author claims that much of the success of his company has come from developing a skilled workforce. Chapter 1. The Unconventional Beginnings The author had rough beginnings in high school where he was often in trouble and eventually kicked out. When he was expelled, he realized that he was getting into trouble because he had a lot of creative energy. He used this energy in starting an English major at college. During his time at college, he got into beer distribution and brewing, and he developed his love for beer. His father was a business pioneer like himself, and instilled entrepreneur values into his son. Some of these values include various business skills and include making sure to tell your customers about what your business values the most. Deciding on what the business values and ensuring those core values are communicated within and without the business is important. The values supersede the people that work within the business and will carry the business through tough times. The author moved into New York, started an English degree at a university, and worked as a waiter. During his time as a waiter, he further developed his network to support his beer brewing skills. He purchased the materials and tools required for making a large batch of brew, and then made a cherry-based beer for his network of friends. He gathered them for a tasting event, and everyone enjoyed his brew. This inspired him to continue a professional career as a brewer. The author purchased a business property to house a brew pub which was located away from the main tourist centre in Delaware, a state in the US. At the time it was also illegal for a brewery to exist, so he lobbied for the law to change. On top of this he was able to convince a brewer enthusiast to help with the setup of his business before it opened. While many of the events the author talks about appears to be poor planning, he is able to leverage his network in order to make ends meet. I'm not sure how he was able to acquire such vast sums of money to fund the adventure. This part of the story was glossed over so far. The key idea from this chapter is that if you have a passion and can share that with other people, you'll be able to leverage your network to propel the business forward. Chapter 2. Business from the Inside Out it's important to understand what you stand for and the passions you are willing to work for. Part of who you are is where you have come from, what school you have attended, and the values of the mentors you have worked under. Your education is important, and in the author's journey, it was his self-education which appeared to be most critical. As he studied the subject of microbrewing at the public library, he discovered it to be a small niche that was ready to be exploited. He found that restaurants which are attached to breweries were more likely to thrive than regular startup rig restaurants. And using this information, he was able to convince banks to give him a loan to fund his adventure. The author encourages doing extensive reading in the industry you are wanting to create a business. Before he started his brew pub, he also experimented with various food recipes and balanced brewing 
All the while, he was an assistant to a brewer, so he had mentors before going on his venture. Something that confused me in this chapter was that the author claims the high school he attended didn't understand his creative energy. Then he goes on to claim the high school was a huge inspiration in being a place where different ideas were encouraged. It appears to be a contradiction to me. Chapter 3. Keeping Your Balance The author describes an incredible day where he had to deliver beer by truck to a distant town. Several mishaps occur along the way, but he somehow makes the delivery. This chapter points out that starting a small business can mean having to go through high-stress events. The author encourages you to set aside time for yourself to pursue a hobby or some kind of artistic-based pursuit. He also encourages taking on a physical activity for daily exercise in order to de-stress. Setting this time aside and pursuing hobbies may appear to be a waste of time. However, many times it is vital in allowing ideas to be processed in the back of your mind, which can mean solutions will arise. Physical exercise is vital to healthy living and for mental health. This time away from your business also affords you to look for opportunities for your business that you may not have noticed. You'll be surprised what kind of links you could make. Chapter 4. Creating a Business Offering Small businesses cannot compete with large corporations. A key to a thriving small business is to stand for a particular offering which the large corporations cannot be flexible enough to supply. Most large businesses are so large that they are slow and cannot bend to particular customer wants and needs. Often they will even market themselves in a way to drive customer demand rather than appealing to specific customer desires. On top of this, large businesses will run on a low price, low margin, high volume economies of scale types of models. This is not tenable for a small business. As a small business, it is important to avoid trying to compete against large businesses. There is no way that a startup can compete on the same stage because it doesn't have the economies of scale, nor does it have the network of clientele. So a small business needs to use a different strategy. The author emphasizes that small businesses need to have a valued approach to providing towards their customers' desires. At the start, this can be labor-intensive because it involves learning about your customer and your customer learning about the business and the product it sells. This exchange of knowledge is critical as it will tell you how to best serve your customer's desires. There may even be desires that you are not aware of which you can provide for. The author calls this type of business model alt-commerce. This is because while your product may cost more, it will be of a higher quality and be more tailored towards your customer's needs. It won't be a one-size-fits-all kind of deal, and it may mean you have to diversify a little. As long as your numbers make sense on the back end, then you should supply to your customer. Since you can't compete on price with the big boys, then you want to compete on value which the author defines as a quality of product, distinction in the market, and education supplied to the customer. The author did this with his own business by supplying ale beer, where 90% of the market is lager, and making his beers have various different taste profiles. On top of this, his brewery was within a restaurant, which meant his customers were in a position to see his work firsthand, as well as enjoy a secondary product being the food from the restaurant. Even more, he would educate the customers about his brew pub and how the types of beer he was supplying could be paired with various meals. Chapter 5. Crafting a Brand in a Cookie Cutter World When presenting your product or service, ensure there are flourishes to the way it is shown to your customers. Since the business model for small businesses is high value, low volume, your product needs to be related to high quality as well. The logo, the marketing blurbs, the package your item comes in, all need to communicate high quality. It's not enough that the item itself is high quality. This means that more time and preparation has to occur in the back end for your product. 
it'll look bad if the product you put out is of a shoddy presentation. It is especially so when some of your marketing will be word of mouth. If the word of mouth is that your product is good, even though it doesn't look good, it'll be hard to make new customers. Chapter 6. Marketing on a small business budget. Marketing can be supplied by a third party, but it is less likely to have your voice. It'll be produced by a marketing company that may not understand the values of your small business and may end up sounding disingenuous. If you write your own pitches and stories about your business, it'll be rough around the edges and this will make it stand out from the crowd. Be open to criticism regarding your marketing and change it as necessary. When deciding on a marketing campaign, focus on three things. Use a consistent voice that reinforces your brand. Focus on the benefits and advantages that your product or service delivers. And motivate the customer to interact somehow. A further differentiation between large and small businesses is what they often focus on. Large businesses are geared towards price, marketing, market share, and attention, where small businesses are geared more to innovation, development, production, and planning. It would be wise to look around at the businesses in your target industry and to figure out where they sit in the industry's environment. Marketing should be an investment that is a portion of your revenue. Dogfish Head uses approximately 3% of its revenue dedicated to marketing. This marketing is usually in places where the large businesses are not present, small publications, beer periodicals, and social media. One way of measuring a return on investment for different marketing channels is to use coupons that have unique codes. Those codes can be associated with specific channels, and if or when they are used within your business, you'll then know where to target more marketing investments in order to get a greater return. Getting quality feedback from customers can come in different forms. The author recommends having a website ready before you start your business and to use internet tools to leverage feedback. Google Alerts can be used to monitor what information is linked to the name of your business. On top of this, you want the business to own up to its mistakes and attempt to rectify any issues that customers have with your product or service. Free merchandise and samples can help while you gather feedback from unsatisfied customers. Keep in mind that not all feedback is helpful and that some customers may not be the target market that you are aiming at. Partnering with your industry will also give you useful information Join up with the local Chamber of Commerce and your industry's associations. These groups will help you notice trends in the market and be places where you can network with other businesses that are willing to support your business. Chapter 7. Going Social Small businesses should engage with their customers closely, especially when it comes to interaction and knowledge exchange. In order to do this, some businesses leverage social media, and many use their own websites. The website for the business should include information that customers can use to know about what is happening recently for the business. Any new ideas related to your products and services can keep your website's visitors' attention as well. Lastly, any way you can get into a dialogue with your customers should be used in order to drive innovation for your business. Chapter 8. Publicity Stunts are Poorly Named Publicity events are instances where your business gets a couple of minutes in the spotlight, and those minutes are used to educate potential customers. A publicity stunt is where this goes all wrong. In this chapter, the author recounts several publicity events and stunts which he was involved with. Publicity events need to be planned well. They will inevitably involve several stakeholders, and it is important to check in with each of them before the event unfolds. Make sure you have an idea for how the event is going to be perceived. It would be wise to ask questions, 
and to get counsel in the planning stage of an event. For small businesses, the author recommends giving out free samples of your business, but to be selective where you make these offerings. He claims there have been several instances when he knew he was just throwing away his product because he knew he wouldn't get any actual sales. In the case of free samples, the customer gets to be introduced to your product and they won't get buyer's remorse for doing so. Chapter 9. Stalking the Killer App Innovation is a key strength for small businesses. The ability to be flexible, hungry for change, and a drive to try out things that will work is inherent to startups. Feeding and using innovation within your business will look different across your business plan, it will include working with your employees and rewarding idea generation and implementation, taking ideas from outside your industry and collaborating with other industries in surprising ways. In the case of Dogfish Head, they attempted to make soaps based on materials from beer waste, and while it didn't sell well to people, it did sell in the dog grooming community. When starting a new product line, the author recommends putting out two new products rather than one. In this way, you can hedge your bets and take advantage of the economies of scale. It's useful to make two products that would appeal to different audiences. That way you spread out your risk across different markets. Chapter 10. Selling Distinction, Specialization and Variety your sales force is the team that brings new horizons to your company. There would need to be com a combination of personalities. We all know of the extroverted salesperson who is the life of the party. They'll go out and meet new people and grow the network. There is also a place for salespeople who are good at managing clientele who are already being sold items. This is especially when new products can be sold to them later in the business relationship. Your sales force is the face of the company. They make the first impression and the continued impression. They should be well taken care of and rewarded for a job well done. They have the finger on the pulse for the business and can gather important information from your customers. A strong sales team is a treasure. Chapter 11. Cash is King. Well, sort of. The author readily admits to being weaker in the financial workings of Dogfish Head than working on growing the sales side of the business. This chapter is especially good reading for those who wanted some actual numbers regarding the financial health of Dogfish Head. There were times where Dogfish Head was in financial trouble, either due to cash flow issues or production. With a board of directors who were experienced and willing to invest in the business, they were able to carry the business by making strategic decisions and selling equity. Your financial statements are key for getting an idea for how your business is actually running and where it is running into trouble. This can give you vital information in choosing a direction to go for the future. It also helps when you approach banks and investors for an injection of funds. When getting loans, make sure you keep in good contact with your debtors. A strong relationship with regular communication can mean you could negotiate future payments if it is required. Chapter 12. Leadership When running a startup, communication is vital for growing your team and having them on the same page as you. You want to have relatively regular meetings. Meetings don't have to be stiff, boring things inside an office where everyone is dressed up and proper. However, they have to be a time where things are voiced and the focus of the company is reinforced. You want to have a dialogue from your employees and help them out where you can. Chapter 13. Effectively Managing Co-workers Managing employees is more about having effective relationships that are built on trust than about micromanaging. Hiring the right people into the right roles is tricky. Sometimes training is needed, and on top of that, we need to be able to give over trust that a person can work with a budget. Maybe that budget is an actual dollar value, 
some monetary fund that a person can work with. Other times a budget is just the worker using their time effectively. As long as there is an understanding between the business and the employee, there are agreements around where you're both heading together, then an amicable process can be set up. Those workers who appreciate the freedom that this setup provides can then flourish the business and grow with the business. Setting up expectations and budgets with your managers rather than for them will give the business owner a better understanding of what is happening in the subunits of the business. Chapter 14 Working Towards Irrelevance This chapter explores ideas regarding handing over the tasks to run your business and your exit strategy from your business. There gradually comes a time where the skills and talents that you offer your own business become less needed. If your business is going to outlive you, then it must outgrow you. In small ways, this will happen in the routine tasks needed for your business to run. You will grow your business to a point where you need to hire people and have others who are better suited to the roles that you fill, either begrudgingly or incompetently. There are better salespeople, managers, laborers, accountants than you could ever attempt to be. It's best to get the best in all these skills, hire them and allow them to manage these tasks by themselves. You'll want to do an initial oversight of their abilities, but over time you should be giving more and more over to them. This also applies to the business as a whole. An exit strategy you could use is to slowly sell off equity positions to those who are most loyal and determined to see the business reaching its goals. Or you may just want to take the business public. The author is clear that this isn't something he wants to do with his own business because he doesn't believe an outside entity could understand the needs of the business as it goes into the future. When should you start making moves out of your business? The author reckons some criteria can be helpful. If you feel that you have done everything you can for the business and you've completed all the projects you set out to do, then it may be time for another to take the reins. There may also be a case of stress and burnout. If you can't face working or managing your business, but know that another could take it to the next step, it may be best for you to take leave. Chapter 15, Home Brew Rendezvous. This chapter is mostly a fictitious story that the author wrote, which involves two characters, based on real people, who have a serendipitous meeting. The meeting is between Woody Guthrie, a significant singer-songwriter of American folk music, and Charlie Papazian, the father of the American homebrewing movement. The story points out the need for convincing narratives for the history of your business. It could even point to what came before your business and inspired the growth of it. In this case, the story almost stands as a type of mythology for Dogfish Head. Chapter 16. To Small Business Success This concluding chapter stands to reinforce the idea that a small business is something that must resonate with its owners. The passion and drive needed to keep it going keep it connected to its community, and to give back to its community are things that only a well-connected owner could do. The author ends the book with a word of encouragement, that you should pursue your innovations with the idea of goodness in mind, goodness that brings joy to your community and for the people involved in your business in many different ways, whether they are a customer, employee, manager, or even those indirectly involved like the city that the business works in and the other local businesses nearby. I enjoyed making this book summary for myself and for you. Please give your next book recommendation in the comments below. If you found this information useful and want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee by following the link in the description. Thank you for listening.